Today, we will, be, we will discuss troubleshooting and maintenance. Over the past three decades, this topic by far has been the most popular with people. Since it is too much information to squeeze into one webinar, we have broken this topic into two. I will be discussing GC troubleshooting and maintenance today, and Lehman will cover troubleshooting and maintenance of GCMS on July 23rd. I will be covering a brief introduction of injectors and troubleshooting and maintenance, a brief introduction of detectors, troubleshooting and maintenance. We will go into column troubleshooting and maintenance in minimal detail because we have a course in the fall semester totally dedicated to columns. And we would like to put more of that information into that course, but some of it is relevant to be in this course as well. So I will move on to the presentation. And again, thank you. To keep up and running, it's appropriate to have spare supplies and parts on hand. I know when I go to my lab and I don't have an appropriate ferrule for a column, that means I can't do my work and I just wasted my time for a cheap, inexpensive part like a ferrule. Also, when you're doing a task, think about the things that you need to complete that task and have them at hand's reach. I know when I go to install a column, I put the septa to mark the distance from my inlet on the column. I put the nut on the column. I put the ferrule on the column. I clip the column to, to rid any debris that may have gotten in the first inch of the column. And I don't have my wrench to tighten the nut. The wrench is four feet away from me and I'm only five feet two. So there's no way I'm going to reach that. So I place it down falls off, the nut falls off and I have to do it again. So it's always nice to have everything you need within hand's reach so that you could complete the task successfully in the first time. <laughs> also, schedule preventative maintenance. How often is your system used? Will determine how much it needs to be maintained. It's always best to do maintenance than to do troubleshooting. If your samples are clean, and you don't have many to run, you will not be doing much maintenance. If you have a very, very dirty matrix, for instance, if you have lubricating oil or crude oil or forensic samples that have biological matrices, uh, you will be doing maintenance more frequently. If you have a log book, when you first get your instrument and you have a log book, you could keep track of when you're doing these things, changing a liner, if you need to bake a column, uh, and, and then you could set a schedule maintenance. The instrument has a counter. So for instance, a septa should be changed if you're making a liquid injection. A septa should be changed around 100 to 110 injections and you could schedule that into the GC firmware and the GC will start beeping when it needs to have that changed to remind you. And also benchmark of system performance when you first get your instrument so that and we'll get into this a little later so that you know that something is going wrong either with the application or the liner needs to be changed or or something or you need to prepare a fresh standard because the standard has gone bad they do have a shelf life depending upon what the type of molecules they are and test mix are critical for confidence that the instrument is working properly, your application is working properly, uh, 
I recommend not doing more than we need to do. People are so busy these days that efficiency goes a long way in preserving time. I feel the best test mix is your own application. The mo molecules are so, organic molecules are so different. You have very easy molecules for GC, like normal hydrocarbons, aromatics. Then you have some difficult molecules like organic acids that are sticky. So people have different detection limit requirements. So if you have a very difficult detection limit or a very stringent detection limit, that may be one of your tests at that detection limit before you start for the week. Run a test mix of that standard that you need to achieve to ensure that you're meeting it before you start your analysis. QC and internal standard control charts to see if you're consistent and that will let you know when something's starting to change, when those responses are decreasing or increasing. And that'll give you an idea of, okay, maybe I have to do some maintenance now, especially if you have difficult compounds. Keeping a benchmark like these control charts are very helpful and makes everything more efficient. Some, some, some environments, like environmental methods, have this requirement. You have to track your internal standard response and your QC response. Also, I forgot to mention in the previous slide, in your logbook, if you have a service engineer visit you, what that service engineer did, he, will give you a, he or she will give you a document of what they did. However, it's convenient to put that in your logbook as well, especially if that person visits you again, it's right there, what was done last. Vendors have test, test mix. We have test mix for precision. We have test mix for signal to noise on our mass spec, which was performed by the engineer when he did his or her installation on your system that you could use if you prefer, that's fine. We, we have a set procedure and set chemicals and it has to meet these specifications or criteria. There's another mix for folks that have difficult GC components. It's called the GROB test mix. And I will be going into that on the next slide. For folks that have active acids and or active bases in their sample, Grob's mix is an excellent identifier that you have, that there is an active site present somewhere in the system that these molecules stick to. <laughs> They're very sticky molecules and they stick to active sites. And we'll be getting into for folks that do have active component, components that are susceptible to this issue, we'll get into how you could deactivate things such as liners later on in the presentation. So when you get this mix, you get the information of the ratio of these molecules to each other. You have very stable molecules in here, for instance, the the aliphatic hydrocarbons, C20, C21, 22, and 14. So if you run this and, you're, and you have um, an active base, for instance, and, and you notice that this compound is starting to, you're starting to see it losses in intensity, when you run this mix again, if nitroaniline has dropped relative to the normal hydrocarbons, that pretty much identifies that you do have an active site in your system somewhere, probably in the liner, that's usually where it is. And so it's, it's a very good quick identifier. Run the mix 
when you put, when your instrument is new and you know you don't have active sites, so you get a profile on your instrument. And then when you see these components starting to decrease in intensity, run it again to confirm that you do. Another th way to confirm that you do have an active site, if you, in if you, if you inject a midpoint standard of your components and the active component is increasing in intensity and then eventually flattens out in intensity with many replicate injections, what's going on is that that active site is being covered. So it's no longer available because the component has covered it. So it's no longer available and now you're you're getting the recovery you want. The problem is that doesn't last a very long time. It's called priming a system. If you if you notice you have an act, and some people do this every day. If you know you have an act, especially um, for McCaptains and sulfur components, which are very active, susceptible to active sites, I should say. So it, you take a high level standard and make several injections. I don't even, I just keep my GC at a high temperature and I just make manual injections to prime my system. And, and that works, but it, the next day, the active site is probably there because the component left it and you'll need to do it again. So most people will deactivate, but bought, purchase deactivated liners or do it themselves. And we'll get into that later. Tom and Crusoe covered injectors in the fourth presentation of this series, which will be on demand very soon when the series is over on July 23rd. We're going to make the whole series available. The function of a an injector port in the GC is typically to introduce the sample. Now, if you're doing a non-column injection, it just provides a guide to the column for the needle to be introduced onto the column. The most common, well, a packed injector port is not popular anymore. You have your static temperature capillary split splitless programmable temperature capillary split splitless. Some folks call it a capillary injector. Some folks call it a split splitless injector. It's the same thing. The temperature programmable has unique features. Um, it's also referred to as a PTV inlet. We also call it a PSS inlet. But it has the difference between the two is one does not program its temperature during the run the programmable temperature one does. Then you can have a dedicated on-column injector, which is pretty a pretty simple design as well. Packed injectors are a very simple design. Less than 20% of folks performing gas chromatography actually use this. It's a lot of old pharmaceutical methods that haven't been updated require this injector and column, I should say. I, I, it, one benefit of a packed column, it's forgiving to non-volatile material because it's not an open tubular column like a capillary column. However, I strongly recommend that people move on to capillary columns. Packed columns have poor resolution, poor efficiency, peak efficiency, and therefore poor signal to noise and sensitivity. You'll enjoy better sensitivity, better resolution, better peak efficiency, moving your application to capillary. The constant temperature capillary split splitless injector is the most common injector in use today. For troubleshooting purposes, I will investigate septum, O-rings, liners a bit, but Tom did a rigorous explanation of liners in his presentation. I will go into, go into seals and other aspects of the injector.
for troubleshooting purposes. The temperature programmable split, splitless injector is very beneficial. We have optimized this design by providing cooling fins and a cooling fan with low thermal mass for this injector to cool very rapidly and also heat very rapidly. I'll discuss the universal benefits of this injector on the next slide. We call the temperature programmable capillary injector universal because it has many modes and many functions. It could be run as a regular hot static injector on column, temperature programmable split and splitless, which has some benefits. You could do larger volumes because you reduce steeper expansion, solvent purge, and therefore large volume injections. I recommend when you're purchasing your instrument, you have the conversation with your technical sales representative and your scientist to determine if this injector would be beneficial for your particular application, because there's many applications in the land of gas chromatography. Let's move on to challenges with hot injections and perhaps controlled volatilization may be preferred. There are many things that can happen in a hot flash volatilization of the sample. There is the worst thing probably is potential for backflash, which means that your sample exceeded the vapor expansion of the sample in the hot inlet exceeded the available line or volume. And I have graphics to show this in the next coming slides. There is also syringe fractionation when there's dwell time in the inlet. More volatile material leaves the gauge of the syringe. So you have discrimination favoring your low boiling point components. This is avoided by a very fast, by your auto sampler being in fast mode. There's, there's many injection speeds the liquid auto sampler can do. And if you have a very broad boiling point component range, making it in fast mode will, will eliminate syringe fractionation. You know, there's also the potential for thermal and catalytic breakdown of molecules that are sensitive to this type of breakdown, like some pesticides, triglycerides, Let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, especially backflash. When, when in this graph at the right, you, this, this shows how the vapor expansion of the sample in the liner occurs. So the injector is at 250 degrees, 10 pounds, injection volume is one microliter, and that one microliter now has expanded to 400 microliters, which happen to exceed the available volume of the liner. So where did it go? If it's not in the liner, what, what got lost will not make it into the column. It could actually go into the pneumatics if, it, if it's a very large vapor expansion, which that usually means replacing of the pneumatics. But the real issue is you're not going to have good results. You'll have poor precision and recovery condensation of higher boilers at cooler, cooler parts of the inlet may later on volatilize and cause carryover ghost peaks. So we try to prevent this. To attain the volume of your liner, most of these calculators you just 
you just select what ID liner that you have, as you can see here in the graph. But if you wanted to do it yourself, it's the equation of a cylinder. What are the parameters to consider? Injector temperature, vo injection volume, inlet pressure, and different solvents have different expansion volumes. One way to reduce vapor expansion is to do a pressure pulsed injection. In this example, we have methylene chloride as a solvent. We have the head pressure at 10 pounds. In the other graph, we increase the pressure to 40 pounds, reducing the expansion volume and the sample stayed in the liner so the entire sample can be recovered, can be flowed into the, in, into the column for better recovery. The way, since I show this in pressure, but most folks would run in constant flow mode, so to set this up, I typically would, would have my flow rate, if I'm in a 30 meter 0.25 ID column, I would have my flow rate initially set to five mils per minute for about a minute. You sh this could be optimized for about a minute. And then I reduce my flow rate to my analytical flow rate Typically on that column, it would be one mil per minute for optimum linear velocity. The, uh, this is explained by math. We have the ideal gas law. If you, re, if you increase the pressure, you're going to decrease the volume. Another way to prevent vapor expansion issues is making a cold injection. The sample is introduced onto the glass wool as a liquid. After the syringe is removed, we have controlled volatilization of our sample, which will eliminate problems with backflash, enhance our accuracy, preventing discrimination, increased recoveries, and enhanced recoveries, not only because you're preventing backflash, but you're reducing thermal and catalytic breakdown by not flashing your sample with high temperature immediately. Typically, you ramp your injector at 200 degrees per minute, but that is operator setting, um, use, a user setting. On the next few slides, we will be discussing the injector port. Uh, liners, not too much because Tom did went into a rigorous job of, of the different types of liners in his presentation. And I, I don't want to bore people by going over that again. You want to match, we want to match our liner to our application. Liner volume, perhaps if you cannot do pressure pulsed, if you cannot do uh, cold, cold injections, Increasing the volume of your liner, going from a two millimeter liner to a four millimeter liner will also help prevent the problems with vapor of exceeding the volume of the liner. Deactivation, if you're doing normal hydrocarbons, you don't have to worry about this. But if you have act components that are susceptible to being stuck to active sites, deactivating the liner is critical. You, Quartz liners may be sufficient. They're more inert than glass. Restec invented a, one of the processes of Siltec coating. I really like that. That's pretty inert. Or the laboratory could deactivate their liners. I know a lot of forensics folks will do 25 liners at a time. We'll get into that in a little, in a little bit. 
positioning of the column we'll get into and if we should use glass fill or not. If we are using a splitless injection, a straight through liner is fine. However, if we're running in a split mode, you need some surface here for mixing of the vapor prior to the split to have precision. So we could run, we could use a split liner in splitless mode, but we cannot use a splitless liner in split mode or a straight through liner, I should say, in split mode because we will not get good precision. I like the cupped liner. I've evaluated many split liners. Everybody has their favorite. This one is mine. Typically, you would have some glass wool here to wipe the needle as it goes into the liner and also prevents debris, non-volatile components from getting into the column. That's the major purpose for glass wool, which is also a, a cipher activity, <laughs> which we'll discuss a little later. For the temperature programmable injector, there's three choices of liners. And I mean liner dimensions, not there's many choices, but just I'm talking about dimensions. One thing I want to mention here, and odd that because this injector can run in on column mode, the, the liner is just has a little hourglass and this hourglass guides the syringe right into the column for on column mode. You do not put the column this far up if you're if you're making if you're not doing on column. This is just for on column mode. So let's talk about the column in the liner when you're when you're not doing on column work. The, the positioning of the column is critical and your manufacturer in, in the, their manual will, will have dimensions of how far you should install the liner from the end of the nut. As you can see, the positioning is only two millimeters. This is to avoid, if the, if the column was further up into the liner, the, the, the analytes have a chance of going outside of the column and not inside of the column, plus you could crush the column with the syringe. But, but this is to prevent carryover to, to enhance recoveries in that injection. This is a graphical representation of the dimensions for our column in our liner. Another thing, so it shows from the back of the nut to the tip of the column. So I typically use a septa for placement so it doesn't move, or you could use a sharp. Sometimes I use a sharpie. I just make sure I don't get the material <laughs> into the nut so that the sharpie material, so that would cause contamination. Some people in the past used to use whiteout. However, that would really make a mess. <laughs> Another thing you need to be careful of is not stripping the threads. It's always best to hand tighten until you can't hand tighten anymore, and then use a wrench um, to, to turn it probably a quarter inch more. If over tightening, is is not good, but not tightening enough will cause a leak. I always pull on the end of the column to make sure it doesn't move. Also, when the cut is made, typically with a ceramic scribe, it needs to be clean. If, if it's jagged, you could have a poor recovery, but more importantly, you cover active possible active sites from 
parts of the column that are exposed that have not been deactivated. The programmable on-column injector is dedicated to on-column injections. The liner is just an hourglass and the hourglass guides the syringe into the column. Applications are for very thermally labile components like triglycerides or targets that are of interest above C44 boiling point, such as ASTM D7169, which is the boiling point distribution for crude oil. The major challenge with this application is you're putting your sample directly into the column without any protection of glass wool to prevent non-volatile components if they exist, as in the case of crude oil. So people that do these applications are very accustomed to clipping their column, maybe 10 inches, and that gets rid of the non-volatile material that has built up on the front of the column. Should we use glass wool? The only reason not is because of activity. However, the, what vendors will deactivate the wool. You can purchase deactivated wool, but when you break the wool apart to insert it in the, inject, in the liner, care needs to be taken because if you tear it, you've exposed the wool to sites that have not seen the deactivated agent. The wool adds surface area to improve volatility. It prevents non-volatile components from getting into the column. If you don't have non-volatile components, you don't have to worry about this. I also, um, I, it should be packed lightly. However, the best way, if, you, if there are active components or components susceptible to active sites, the safest thing to do is to deactivate the wool and the liner in situ, which means placing the wool into the liner and deactivating it at the same time. Deactivation materials do go away with time However, the liner probably would need to be replaced because of dirt before the deactivation material leaves. If compounds has possibility to be sticky or active, use deactivated silenized liners or deactivated liners. Here, there is materials out there that we could use ourselves. Here's instructions. The material does come with instructions on it and methanol will, will rinse because the, the, the silanol groups are soluble in methanol. So you use toluene as a rinse first and then methanol takes away any of the excess material. Dirt and liner is a source of activity where active components can stick to resulting in poor recovery, possible carryover in later injections. Liner replacement, how often do we need to do this? Well, if you're using a concentrator where the non-volatile material and the heavier components are remaining in the sparger with purging trap or in the vial with headspace, probably never. Also, you do not need glass wool with headspace purging trap applications. Semi-volatile analysis, typically requires replacing frequently. And it really does depend upon how your matrix, how, how dirty it is, how much you're injecting, your injection volume, how many injections you're making a week. So, but that wouldn't change. It should be a regular schedule. So after you start injecting, you could keep track of when you're replacing your liner and then you could make a schedule to replace it before you see a problem. That's a better way to do it.
If you do not have a swafer device or a prevent device to isolate your injector port from your analytical column in your detector, make sure your column is at ambient temperature prior to remove, opening up the injector port because oxygen can oxidize when the column, when the oven is hot, when the column is hot, you can oxidize your column. So I just I just open up the oven door, so I don't forget, I, so that it, the heater isn't turned on. It's best to use nice chill gloves, especially if you're use if you need low detection limits. If you're not in the grass and you don't, that that bit of contamination won't matter. Especially if you have a mass spec or an ECD detector where you, where they're more sensitive detectors. What I do is I increase my split flow after I replace my liner to rid any excess oxygen quickly. Then for non-polar columns, I let it purge for 10 minutes. For polar columns, they're more susceptible to oxidation. I purge for 20 minutes before I apply heat to my oven and in my injector. You could also use your, your heater on your injector to bake it out a little bit, which is what I do too. I in high flow rate, go up to 350 degrees or the temperature you need and just let it purge with the oven hot. The purpose of the O-ring in a capillary inlet is to seal the liner. If the O-ring isn't there, the injection will not be made into the column. I know this because I have done this before. <laughs> Kelres is required for ECD and MS. It depends on the temperature of your injector. The, some material like Viton off gas excessively at temperatures above 250 degrees, and that material should not be used if your inlet is above that. But with ECD and MS detectors, I see off-gassing even at low temperatures, so I always use Kelres. I replace my O-ring every fifth time I replace my liner. Uh, you know, that needs to be, depends on how, how much temperature you need on your injector port. Some people go up to 425 degrees, so they're replacing these things more frequently. The SEPTA also, depends on the temperature. There are very high temperature materials that can not off gas even at 400, above 400 degrees. Your septa needs to be replaced because it can, at, you know, you're making many injections and this hole is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the helium isn't gonna be staying in the injector port, it's gonna go out the hole. So, Every 100 to 120 injections, the Merlin SEPTA is great. It can handle 4,000 injections. Troubleshooting contamination. This is always fun. Isolating possible sources will help us find that problem quicker. Detector contamination starts at time zero. Cap the detector. Um, if it's an FID or a mass spec, pump it, FID light it, and make a run with it capped. If the contamination goes away, we know it's not the detector. If it's there, we know where the source is. It could be poor, it could be poor um, gas. You got you got bad gas, fuel gases. Uh, it could be a jet that's dirty, a source that's dirty. Injector contamination is chromatographical because it has void time going down. A quick way to check is to cool the inlet and make two blank runs. Heat the injector. If the contamination returns, then the contamination is most likely in the inlet. It could also be the column. It, it could be um, syringe carryover. Your solvent, wash, and waste files should be changed routinely because because your syringe or sample is going into those, so they should be refreshed depending on how many injections that you make. The solvent may be the source of the contamination. I always do an instrument blank, which means I just schedule a run from my data system, 
and I hit the run button on the GC. And that's a way if if there's not if the contamination isn't there, it's maybe the solvent uh, or some part of the sample that is is be it could be the the septa on the vial because if you're doing mini double dips on one vial especially with ecd detectors the pieces of the septa particle goes into the sample and and leaches out into the sample or solvent with time and you'll and they their peaks, their chromatographical peaks. So that's another source of contamination. Gases are sources of contamination. The tank pressure should not drop below 400 degrees. So I was in my lab once, my, my tank dropped and my FID was, was just, it was my hydrogen and my FID was just all over the place. I put on a fresh tank. The, the, the contamination didn't go away. My tank was, this took me two days, and my tank was contaminated. The brand new tank that came in was contaminated. Filters are great, but if it's that contaminated, filters may get consumed. Again, with chromatographical contamination, it also could be the syringe. I forgot to mention that. Columns. We don't want to exceed the maximum allowable temperature of the stationary phase. The column manufacturing sure did many tests to ensure that temperature. Verifying the carrier gas with a flow and leak, leak check. Oxygen, again, is not good for detectors and it's not good for columns when they're at high temperatures. If possible, when you're conditioning the column, disconnected from the detectors. With pack columns, that's necessary because it, pack columns are just, are just not, they're, not, they're very, they're, they come very contaminated because of the packing material. Cycling actually, I find, stabilizes the baseline and conditions the column quicker. So I will let it go up to temperature, 15 minutes, bring it down, and I cycle it this way a couple of times. Um, column storage, if it, the way that it's recommended to purge the column with helium or, nit or an inert gas and seal the column, I just use the septa. I put both ends into a septa. And I always record my column history on the box. I, especially if the column is susceptible, but I may need it again, I'll say probably bad, but try it anyway. If it's really bad, please just throw it in the garbage because it's just gonna waste your time if you put it back in the GC and it's really bad. For detector maintenance, a real quick way is to cap the detector, have the flow go through the detector, whether it's an ECD makeup gas, increase the makeup gas. You could use the same for an FID, just use the regular flow settings and bake it overnight at 50, 450 degrees. Sometimes because the base of the detector is in the oven and will not get as hot, for ECD applications, I usually remove the column and bring the oven temperature up to 350 degrees as well as the detector up to 450 degrees. Sometimes you have to change or clean your jet or, in, um, the, or the collector or the anode in the case of an ECD detector. But usually for Baking it out, the ECD usually works for me. I consider this to be a fun slide because I have made all of these mistakes in my career since 1988. Back in the day, detectors didn't light themselves like they do today. <laughs> Only if you have that feature enabled, which sometimes I forget to do as well. So the detector is not lit or turned on. No carrier gas. Back in the day, 
they didn't have pneumatic control EPC, so the GC didn't beep at you when there was carrier gas. Now it beeps at you, fortunately. The sample wasn't introduced. Your syringe is clogged or defective or broken. Take the syringe out, bring up some solvent and, and dispense it. If nothing comes out, it's probably clogged. If you don't have another syringe, what I typically do is use hot water to try to get, especially if, if, if you, there's any salts or something like that, you probably could, could get it cleaned up or unclogged that way. Um, made injection and wrong injector port. If you have two injectors, you, you may have accidentally sent the auto sampler to, even if you, I do this with manual injections. I, will, I need to inject in B, but I inject in A. Um, two detectors in your GC method, it directs what channels being collected we may have made a mistake, injected into the wrong vial. These are the obvious things. Obvious things should be checked first because it'll save a lot of time. Peak tailing, I'll do a little bit of column stuff even though we will cover this more rigorously in the column course. Active components tend to tail because of their stickiness especially carboxylic acid. So selecting the best column for that molecule is the best. Um, another thing that can do, it's usually because of absorption properties, but making a fast injection helps. Bringing up the injector temperature can also help this problem. Peak fronting, also known as shark fin, because the peak looks like a shark fin instead of Gaussian, is probably 95% of the time overload of the stationary phase. Things that we could do, thicker film columns that have more stationary phase, but if you have a mass spec or an ECD detector, that's not good for those detectors. Dilute your sample, inject less. The less amount of sample that is introduced, the cleaner the system is going to be. Increase the split ratio. Increase the column capacity. Perhaps the column temperature is beneath the boiling point of the solvent. The, you, there may be an incompatibility with the compound and the stationary phase or incomplete vaporization, but it's usually overload of the stationary phase. Yes, and inject less. Everything, will, if, you, if we can and get our detection limits, inject less sample. Another preventative maintenance is when, before you put a column in, inspect it. Uh, removing the first meter of, of the column is helpful if, you're, if there's non-volatile components around. I, I once had a pinhole in a column, and so when I install the column, I always put the, and I turn on my carrier gas, I always put the end of the column in solvent so I see bubbles. I found out I I, I, that, that one drew, drove me crazy. I actually put the column in, in water, just like a tire that has a hole in it, how they find the hole. And I saw, it, I saw the, the, the leaking of, from the hole. Another thing we could do to isolate the column is install a new column or one of known performance. Run the test. If the same problem exists, it's probably the system. If the problem goes away, then the column is at fault.